Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee. I don't know where Envy went, but uh, we have a very special guest in the building right now. She is celebrating 20 years of one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Mara Brock Akil is with us. Good morning, Queen. Good morning. I am so happy to be here with you guys. Oh my God. I, this is, I mean, what would there ever be a celebration without a girlfriend without you? <laughs> I, I would hope not. I need to just sit back. because uh, <laughs> You jump in there too. And I hope you're a fan too. I hope you, I hope, uh, well, how old are you? I am actually a woman, but you know, I just... <laughs> <laughs> I am actually a black woman, so there's a lot of themes and topics I can relate to, but I know, <laughs> Charlamagne, I feel like I can't even compete, so, you know, I, I am in this, though. <laughs> okay, well, good, good, good. <laughs> well, the beauty of girlfriends, like you just said, it is a lot of topics and themes that men can learn from, and I got put on to the show by my, my now wife, who was my girlfriend back then. Uh-huh. I used to be at the house, she used to have it on, and you know how it is when you're a woman watching her show, you got to sit there and watch it, but then I started to love it, too. Oh, I love, you know, it's funny. We talked about that. We mm-hmm. talked, I said, you know what? Hey, I think I want this TV show to be the one where the, where the, where the sisters are like, sit your ass down somewhere. We are watching this. You don't have to watch with me. You can watch with me. You can do something, but this is going to be on. It was going to be a appointment television for black women. It was a, t- a place for us to be seen. You know, Sex in the City was on at the time. I mean, we couldn't even be extras in that show. I love that show, by the way. But I was like, but I want to add, I have something I want to say in this com- this time, this turn of the century. So thank you to your wife, Ev, um, smart. And so you're a smart man from Erin, a smart woman who right. loves this little girlfriend. <laughs> right. I Sex in the City, I do want to say, because I do like that show also, but... I felt like I couldn't see myself in that show, right? I mean, like, literally. I couldn't be entertained by it. But I was like, this isn't, like, there's topics you could relate to, but when you don't see yourself in the show at all, it is hard. Like, you kind of feel like you're on the outside watching something. And for girlfriends, since you guys are going to put all the seasons on Netflix this weekend, we're actually the next uh, episode of my podcast, we're dedicating to some of the topics from girlfriends. Like, what would you do if your man was wearing a girdle? <laughs> a waist trainer because envy wears waist trainers i know he's not here right now but we actually have he did get a waist trainer at one point and then started bike riding with it on and that's how he managed to lose a lot of weight <laughs> it works i mean you know and it's funny it's funny how you know with women you know girdles i mean that's what we were calling it in the episode i believe <laughs> It was a couple calling girdles, you know, it has such uh, shame around it for women. You know what I'm saying? But you know, mm-hmm. to your point, now that it's a, a um, it's a waist, it's a, it's a, it's a waist trainer and you can be out in the public, you put it around your t-shirt, ride your bike and everybody's like, oh, that's cool. You know, it's like, no, <laughs> it's like, no. I, I, I have a plan this weekend with the wife to sit around with some adult beverages and binge watch Girlfriends on Netflix all weekend. What what are you feeling right now in regards to Girlfriends being released on Netflix? You know, what am I feeling? That is such a simple yet, I mean, the easy thing is to say joy is what I feel. I feel validation in a lot of ways, you know? I think, meaning I knew that this show was big enough for a platform like Netflix. I mean, you know how many years it has taken to even be on a streamer? Like I was I was telling like when way back in the day, I'm like, "Hey, can we get can we get on can we get on Netflix? Can we get on Apple? Can we get on can we get to these places?" And nobody was feeling it and I didn't understand it. And I that that took a little um that was humbling. That was humbling because I knew this show so all this time we were when we were producing it for UPN and then CW, it had value. But it, I knew that it, it deserved a bigger audience. And so to be here, to be on Netflix, to um, I feel aligned. <laughs> I feel aligned. I feel joy. Um, yeah, I'm ready though. I'm ready to. I'm ready to revisit. That's what I'm ready to do. I you know I want to get some dirt though, Mara, because last what time you, you want what you want Angela. <laughs> That you had the movie written already. So now that you have this deal at Netflix, is there talks in bringing that movie? No, for the record, this is exciting because my Netflix deal was, you know, the mothership of Netflix is so big. My deal for an overall deal was happening on this side of the mothership and 
strong black lead getting these 90s sitcoms. Let's just give it up for strong black lead. I mean, for them to say, we are going to get our culture and we're going to put it on, we're going to put it on the biggest streamer out there so we can all enjoy this. Um, fantastic. But that deal was happening separately. So those conversations are still very separate. It was, and again, if that's not God's timing, that the announcement, the alignment, the 20th anniversary of this would happen at the same time. I feel ready, prepared for this moment. God's got a plan for me and I'm my pencils are sharpened. My pink, my, my, my ink is in my pen is what I wanted to say. Um, so in terms of a movie, I'm open. I told you guys this before when I was on the show, I'm open, I'm here. Um, it costs, it, and, and everybody knows it's there. They've got the algorithms, they got the analytics. If they want it, they got me, <laughs> I'm right there. And so, but I also have to, um, I got, I just have this amazing new deal. I'm so excited. I got some other stuff to write. I got other things to do. And so when they're ready, they'll knock on my door or they'll pick up the phone and I'll be there. You know, your, your previous answer about, um, you know, how you're feeling, maybe, maybe come up with another question, like expound on the validation part. Like what validates a creative like yourself? Like what validates your okay. work for you? If, so when the time that I was, I'm an artist and yeah, I, I, I could sort of paint at home or write at home, but I don't, I'm not writing just for my own. I want to have a conversation with culture. I want to have a conversation with my audience. And so if someone says to you, Charlemagne, well, if you're an artist too, well, do you want to just show your art in your house or you want to just show your art at the, at the corner gallery that's, you know, kind of like a, what, a thousand square feet, or do you want to go to the largest museum or the largest gallery? You know, say if you want to go to the Met or if you want to go to these institutions that people say are the, are the, <laughs> it's the place to be, that's where I want to go. Um, and I want to be able to showcase there. I mean, it's, it's, why not? And, and why, and, and so I think sometimes our, our art gets, I just want a big stage. I want a big stage. I want to have a conversation with the world and why not? And I, I wanted to have that then. And so now all these years later, 20 years later, 20 years later that we've landed um, on Netflix, it allows for the largest stage ever. I, I, I'm hopeful maybe they can roll it into also a, a, the global audience because right now it's a domestic release um, that they have for these shows. I think these shows would be would be amazing for the world to see. Um, I think a lot of our humanity, a lot of our black culture, you know, a lot of our, um, a lot of the showrunners and the writers and the directors and the actors, you know, they gave a lot in the nineties. We were, we were, we had a lot to say musically, as you guys know, we had a lot to say. We were, right. the doors were just opening and we wanted to share a bit of who our humanity is in those stories and they are worth spreading, you know what I'm saying, to, to the global audience. Um, so the validation for me is in the, is in the idea that our stories deserve a world stage. True indeed. Mara, how has your writing been during this pandemic? I know you've had a routine. I remember reading this whole article about what you do every day and what your weekly routine is like. <laughs> but now I'm sure the kids are home. Uh, you guys are in the house. I know you have other places where you write, but what is that routine and how has it affected your writing? You know, the, the, uh, you know, I've, one thing I will say, I've always in, taken the times. I think that's what artists are supposed to do, reflect the times. And one thing I love about us as a people is that we can, the resiliency of us, um, but the, our pain and suffering is there, but how we trans, transition that, or we sort of grow from that, or we build from that, um, our fight, our constantly calling America to its greatest self, <laughs> you know, right making it live up to his word. All of that has been us. And so now it is amplified in such a way um, that it's something that's always been also in my body of work. So it's just more of the same. Angela would really be the short answer. It is, I think what I've had to manage is my own emotional, um, as we all are, I'm sure, just taking care of myself and trying to hear and, and observe and that I'm not, that I'm not so emotionally wrought all the time that I can't see what's going on and record the stories and understand what we're going through and process it through, you know, this type of storytelling that I do. Um, 
So I've been journaling a lot. I've been catching a lot of ideas. So for the writers out there, I think it's okay not to feel like you have the script complete. I think it's okay to just catch a feeling, catch an idea, catch an observation, but record it. Get those, whether you voice record it or you write it down. I think those are important because when you get the space, you'll have a chance to sort of execute it into um, a script or whatever the, the final outcome will be. That, that's what I'm interested in because, you know, I'm a, I'm a person that I, I go to a lot of therapy and I got sacred purpose coaches and stuff like that. But I think this moment made a lot of people sit down and see themselves for the first time. So I can't wait until some of these writers who were forced to be alone yes. with themselves. <laughs> I can't wait to see what that looks like. Yeah, and just me too, by the way. I mean, that's what I've been doing. I've been, I've really just, especially even with this deal, I want to sort of, how am I going to help shape the new narrative in so many ways about being where we are as a culture that I think that's the best storytelling when you sort of see yourself, but in the larger, in the larger scope of things as a collective and you sort of move through that together. I think that creates these magical TV shows, these magical moments, these water cooler where we can come around and, and, and keep the conversation going. Oh, you know, um, girlfriends did that. You know, I'm hoping to do that again. Being Mary Jane did that. Love is did that. You know what I'm saying? Black lightning is doing that. I mean, so those, uh, personal, personal reflections against the larger society reflections and how we move to a co as a collective is, um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. And, I, and there's another thing too. How do we also not get stuck in pain? That's the other yes. thing I've been thinking about, you know, yes. how do we not get stuck in pain? How do we actually show the, the beauty of this time? How do we show that the shedding, you know what I'm saying? Getting in there deeper. Um, and that can come through and then, and then how to be funny with that or how to be even more dramatic with that. Um, it'd be interesting. You know what I wanted to ask you about um, Tyler Perry, right? And he said that, you know, that as far as doing his shows that he writes everything himself, he wrote the whole season himself. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that as a creative yourself, have you ever written like a whole series on your own? Do you think that collaboration is more important? I just wanna know how you work personally. I believe in one vision, many voices. That's how I've always worked. Um, I think it's part of my job as the creator, as the showrunner is to be able to articulate, this is what this is about. And then be, then my biggest job, Angela, really is to be a good listener, to hear the best ideas for the greater good of the, of the show. And I've been so blessed to work with amazing voices. I'm, uh, um, so many people have shaped it. We're talking about girlfriends. I have to give a shout out to Sheldon Epps, who was who did who directed between he and Celine, they directed and helped shape the show as the directors. I of course I gotta give a shout out to the cast. I mean, what those actors put and body into those words, it wouldn't be the show. So this it's a collaborative effort to, you know. Uh, the DPs that we had, Don Morgan, the, this costume, all of it is a part of, we get to play together and bounce off of each other. So that energy is just keeps building between all of us. And my job as the, as, as the boss <laughs> is to know that their ideas are better than mine today. <laughs> Go with those ideas, but be able to lead and say, this is where we're going. I think I remember one thing that comes up to my comes to mind. I remember when you guys maybe remember the the four episode arc that we did with Kimberly Elise. Um, yes. The, 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 yes. Yes. I took that to the writers' room. They were like, "What?" <laughs> I remember Kenya Barris was one of the first one. Like, guys, this is a comedy, and I'm like, "Uh, yeah." And we're gonna figure this out because this is what's real and this is what's happening. Yet we are surviving it. Yet we are dealing with it. How can we be a part? How do we give back to the culture? How do we take? ownership of a story that is hurting black women the numbers that i think still now to check them as of today but back then the numbers were hurting black women the most and i believe that statistic still stands and so oh no we're going to take care of black women we're going to bring this to we're going to bring this to bear and yeah we're going to figure out how to be funny <laughs> you know those kind of things um tackling subjects class we every time i remember when i first started talk, talking about class 
it was a very painful thing for some people to deal with, but it's very painful when you think about how we treat each other. It's like sometimes we're talking about the man all the time, but sometimes even class can be one of our hardest, our hardest, um, even Dr. King talked about that. That's the biggest thing that's going on here in America is that the, the class worker and look what we're dealing with now. But my point is some of the comedy and that we got out of class between Maya and um, Joan. I mean, even one of my funniest ones was with Cat Williams, when Maya set uh, Joan up on a date and Cat Williams came and Joan was all bougie and he just read her, you know, th things like that we were able to find and dig deeper when we were challenged by the hard stuff. And um, so that's how I collaborate, Angela. It's just like, you know, we, I, Sometimes you got to be the one that says, yeah, we're going over here. It might be easier to go this way, but let's go forge a new path and let's go to here and everybody roll your sleeves up. Let's go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's go. As a man, the Kimberly Elise episode literally just made me be like, I'm never cheating ever again. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't, now don't get me wrong. I didn't stick that. But at, at, the, at the moment, I was, I was like, I'm good. Yes. You know what I mean? At, or at least wrap it. No, come on, guys. Let's be oh. honest about. Let's just let's be honest about what we're doing out here, so that maybe we can not only protect ourselves, but we can protect each other. You know. Yeah. And something that hit home for me too was like toxic friendships and thinking about people that you're friends with if they're actually causing you like mental anxiety and strain in, in your own life. Oh my god. That was. I mean. You know, it's funny. One of my secrets for making girlfriends was at the time again, Sex in the City had Carrie was always trying to get big, right? Well, I decided to make Joan and Tony that quote unquote romantic relationship. Like, will Joan and Tony ever make it? Like Carrie and Big, will they ever make it? So when sort of like putting the core around the, and that very needed support group of, I want to honor uh, the girlfriends, that women need those support groups. That's how we survived a lot of stuff. That's how we thrived in a lot of ways. I wanted to celebrate that, especially the generations of black women I've seen things sit around the kitchen table and talk about things. I want to honor that, but I also wanted to challenge to your point, Angela, that at what point is it good and in, 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 of service to you or when you have to shed those things and move on. But when you raise the bar, like when, as, as you know, Joan was such a character that was so like, like giving a little too much to Tony until when she sort of set a new boundary and a new, uh, you know, and, and, and pulled the vibration up on that friendship, Shoot, I think, you know, uh, Tony got born again. I mean, that's how far she had to go with it, you know? So we found fun ways to talk about very tough subjects. You know what I'm saying? Things that are like, people don't bounce back from toxic relationships sometimes, yeah, you know? With, with your friend, with your best girlfriend is like harder than a breakup with a man sometimes. I know, right? <laughs> it is. Because you're so used to talking to them all the time and then that betrayal hurts more than anything. Oh yeah, or that it, it's it's, it's, and I think that's, again, the core things we're talking about in our human experience, like betrayal. And, and how does it look like with a man? How does it look like with your best girlfriend? How does it look with family? How does it look? Because even when we did the, um, the Wigger episode, you know what I'm saying? Amazing. That was a betrayal, you know, just, we, we were just, but, but knowing that's what we were doing. Um, I'm proud of that. I'm very happy that we were really, you know, able to go there and not just keep the comedy just but um bum you know but um bum all the time which was something that was very um which were sometimes notes we're like we used to get notes from the network uh where's the jokes on this page i'm like uh, how about where's the engagement on this page you know what i mean that's um because even going back to the hiv and aids episode the other thing i really wanted to say and had a lot of compassion is for our brothers our, our brothers who felt like they needed to be on the down low why don't we create space for them to be who they are? And then look where, look where we are in the conversation of LGBTQ. You know, I, I'm, I'm proud of, we need to make space for each other, not hide each other, you know? And you know, it, it, it's, it's crazy as it sounds, even though it wasn't supposed to be comedy. When Kimberly Elise cut herself, oh. everybody's like, oh. <laughs> at the time, it's like funny, but it's also that would have been the reaction for people back then because we didn't really know what HIV and AIDS yeah. was to the extent we do now. Yes, to be able to reflect, kind of like when we were talking about like, what's next? How are these times? How are these times uh, gonna come into the work? That's what was we were doing. We we were ignorant.
about the disease. And so here was an opportunity for us to, we were ignorant on many, many levels, we, but our numbers were staggering. So it's like, okay, let's get in here. And that was honest. And that was a big, talking about, Angela, you're talking about collaboration. We used to come together, um, so we would do run through is what they're called. We would, you know, rehearse, rehearse, and then we do a run through and the actors and writers would sit and talk about it. That was something Kelsey added to the show. This is something they did on Frasier and we would literally talk about it. Um, people would talk about their discomfort. We would get it all out and then we would see, and then again, we, we would go back to the writer's room and we would iron that stuff out so that everybody felt heard. Again, one vision, many voices. And then after that time, this is what we're gonna do. But that reaction you're talking about, that was challenging because everyone wants, everyone wants to think that they would have a different reaction Mm -hmm. on a when we're doing a script when we're doing a play and i'm like no let's be honest a lot of us are going to you're not thinking you are simply reacting you're not having a conscious response you're having and it takes the burden sometimes of like kimberly lisa's character not only does she have to live with the disease she also has to be the teacher and <laughs> she right. also has to tell people and so the burden we put on people who are actually actually going through things. Look about Black Lives Matter. How many race talks have y'all had? You know what I'm saying? Like, not only do we have to survive racism, now I got to teach you about racism. It's so much all the time. So that's how the writing sometimes, or the times can affect the writing, because if I can get to that, to have compassion for her, like, man, maybe, maybe I can take this burden off of her. Next time I'll know um, that at least you're not going to get AIDS if you, you're not going to get HIV if you, you know, have a bloody knife, you know, that kind of now, vibe. Now, see, cultural context really matters because I'm interested to see people watch this show for the first time this weekend, see episodes like that one, see episodes like the one where Lynn's half-sister uses the word nigga. And right. in their mind, they're going to be like, of course you can't use that word, but it was a different <laughs> time back then. We had to have the discussion about well, why people could use it. Still don't know. I'm still, yeah, some people still don't know. Oh, yeah. It was like, it was, I think at that time we were doing that, and correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, 20 years is a long time, and I, I have not taken my vitamins this morning so, or, my, or my ginkgo shot, but it's, um, I believe at the time, I'm very pretty clear, like some major celebrities were like, no, we can say it because it's in a song, right. which is why we did it the way we did it. Everybody- yeah. uh, yeah, Long ago too. <laughs> yeah. That's an age old discussion. That's an age old discussion. But yeah. But there, I think at the time they were very vocal about it. That's what I'm trying to say. They were trying to say, when you put it in your music, vocal. it's for us. And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or was there ever a time the network shot down an episode because they felt like it would be too racy or they were like, I don't know if we can address this because we've seen other series where people are like, oh, this episode never came out. We saw Blackish, they put out an episode that never came out previously. Was there ever a topic that they were kind of scared to touch? This is a fun one, Angela. Um, I'm very proud of this one in, in a lot of ways. So give me two seconds. So the Black women's sexuality. So I came into wanting to write girlfriends and at the time most black women characters on tv and we're also talking about music videos so music videos were huge at this time i mean you know we were it's so the the idea about black women sexuality was you are a hoe you are groupie you're more in that category or on television because they weren't writing our interior lives you know what i'm saying so that you didn't have a personal life you were just the judge or the asexual judge the person you don't who they were sleeping with so it's like there, there's this vast void between asexual judge and the you know the the black the black okay. woman yeah thanks so it was so i come into the series with that on my mind that our sexuality is not going to be demonized and it is going and we need to shed this and we had a lot of shame around that no we are sexual beings and that doesn't make us a hoe so there was a joke run that we did, but I actually won this fight. And, um, but it was a joke run where the girlfriends were talking about what they, what they wanted. And it was all in great jokes, right? It wasn't direct, but it was like what they wanted for pleasure. And it was all, and so those jokes got flagged in the, um, in the script. And funny enough, I knew they were gonna get flagged. And you might remember this, there's another joke in the same script where the William character talks about his blue balls. 
And they howled during the run through about this joke. It was so funny. It was so funny, but they didn't say anything about it. So now I'm in the note session and they're like, nope, get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of this. And I had that sucker in my back pocket. I was like, okay. First I argued it just like I said, hey, this is black women's, um, this is their empowerment. And when, and when, when women are empowered by their own sexuality, by their choice, they will a be responsible. They will show up. They will buy the condoms. They're not going to wait for a man. They will take care of themselves when they own their, their sexual choice, sex positive. Right. And then they were like, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, take it out. And then I was like, okay, well then when we're taking out blue balls too. Yeah. So and the they were like, about that, but the women yeah. can't talk about themselves. Yeah. So when basically I said, so basically what you're telling me, this is like, this is all a note session with executives. So what you're telling me is, so jokes about sex when women are, when, when it's for the pleasure of men, they're okay. But when women want, have, have their own choice of pleasure, then that's not okay in 2000, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And they turned red and they were mad. And then it was like, so then it got to agents. You know, they still, we were still talking about it. And it was, it was more like, fine, you won. And it was more like that. And I was like, thank you, thank you. And then later I will give them credit after during the run through, I mean, during the taping of it and the response to the audience. That was one of the tricks too, that really helped producers because when the audience came in, when we would fight over jokes sometimes or fight over content, the audience, the live audience would be sometimes our barometer of, of the fight. And so when that audience laughed, I was like, oh God, oh God. So that, that's like one less fight I have to say, yeah. So those were just, that was a little inside, uh, inside of, uh, what do you call it? Inside, I'm losing my word. Anyway, inside, inside the, baseball. Thank you, thank you. And that's my child's, my youngest favorite sport, inside baseball for you about those kind of things. But I was, those are the kind of things that I was doing all the time. And, um, but that's, what my job is supposed to do that I'm, I'm learning how to make those fights um so that we can get it on the air that's what that's what my job is so funny i'm excited about watching the shows because sometimes i can remember how hard it was to get those shows on the air you know what i'm saying and what was working so now i get to just be i can just enjoy i can just go back and just have fun and relax you know what i'm saying i don't have to worry about ratings i don't have to worry about you know are we gonna get another the season, you know, I could just really enjoy what we did and celebrate it. You know, Mar, you don't you don't get the credit you deserve for not just being a creative, but for literally reviving network studio work. Like you, you, you did it with girlfriends on UPN, the game for CW, being Mary Jane with BET. Is there rewards for that? Does that get you like green lights in Hollywood forever or what? Well, it gives me a good Netflix deal. <laughs> I finally got there, but you know, I will be, I thank you for a saying that I'm very proud of it. And, you know, you know, I want to be, I, I want that to be known. I want people to see that because that took a lot of work and it, it took a lot of um, faith and belief and, um, and I'm proud of that. It also launched a lot of careers by holding, by holding the door open, not only launching the door but holding the door open people a lot of people got a chance to develop which is another is it is is a um is one of the biggest assets is time and experience so that we can develop voices that can carry on the baton and you know you can have the insecures of, of the world people can still you know enjoy those programming um but the reward so the rewards are in that. The rewards are in in seeing that we were able to do it and we sustain it and the careers we were able to build. And to be honest, Charlemagne, the the I I I took a lot, I take a lot of pride. Both me and Salim do. We take a lot of pride on the many jobs, job creation. You talk about one of the issues we're having in today's time, a lot will be fixed with job creation. The job creation that we were able to do for people to put roofs over their head to send kids to college to all of those things are in this moment for me so that would be the validation that I I you know there are times when I feel sorry for myself when I'm ego tripping and I want some hardware maybe I want somebody to call my name I want somebody to I want to you know um, be celebrated in the way of an Emmy or things of that nature and um, those are still goals of mine, but God has a plan. And I, I'm hoping that, um, and I'm still in the game. So I, I'll, 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 I'll get there. 
it's going to be interesting because um, I have a feeling girlfriends are going to break a lot of records on Netflix as far as viewing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, like I, say, I, I like when you talk like that. No, I do. I, I really do. So it's just going to be interesting to see how people, you know, just, just come back around to you for like, for like, oh, a, a thank you. Phrase. What I want to know, Charlemagne, what is some of, so you told me how you got there, but what, you know, one of the things that we, you're just a, you are, you are a validation to something, a fight that I, I said, I said, I, black men are going to show up for this show. They were like, because there was times when they wanted the guys to be a little sillier on the show, like the, the you know, sort of taking pot shots more at men. I said, no, this is not going to be a, a male bashing, you know, it's not going to be a male bashing show. And I think a lot of black men were worried it was going to be. Because um, I always said that, that the, the women are as, they're going to be as great as the men are great. We have to make great challenges for them. So anyway, that was one of my theories. And the fact that you're a big fan and you're, your girlfriend, now your wife, um, said, sit down and watch it. What made you stay? Why? What are some of your favorite episodes? What did you see that made you girlfriend's number one fan? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think because it was very relatable because it seemed like at the time, it seemed like now. You know what I mean? Like they weren't corny, you know? Like you would hear like the hip hop lingo and the hip hop conversation. And for me at the time, that that cut through what what was on was, was on TV at the time, and then oh. it was the, de the depictions of the, the the women, of course, because you learn so much. But the brothers like William, because William was somebody who people might consider corny, but he wasn't. He had a great job. He had a lot of women, beautiful women that he was. <laughs> I know, Keisha Sharp. I mean, Monica Charles Brooks. <laughs> yeah, and then like D Darnell was like the working class black man who was really trying to do right by his family. And, you know, I just, I, I, I don't know. It's just, it just relatable on so many different levels. Oh, thank you. So William was my ode to, you know, a lot of black women were saying, they're no good black men. They, and I was like, we are, we have to take ownership for a lot of the brothers we are overlooking. You know what I'm saying? So right. William was, um, was, a, was a representative of that. And um, Darnell was also a representative of that. Sometimes, just like you were saying, Omar, you don't get enough credit. I don't think the brothers get enough credit for the good fathers that they are, the good, you know, the, the good um, boyfriends and thus husbands that they are. You know, I don't think that we talk about that enough and we keep promoting one narrative all the time. And so, you know, the dog, you know, that was, you know, yeah. and so, yeah, we run into dogs. You know what I'm saying? We, we go have some of those, but there's a lot of good brothers. Like, it's funny. Uh, Salim and I always talk about like, you don't really talk about black people having a hard time hooking up below the 10. Here in LA, the 10 is like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's like real, you know, down there by Baldwin Hills and Ladera Heights and, you know, Compton, Gardena. Like there's a lot of black people finding each other and building beautiful lives together. But it's, you know, in this Hollywood side of LA where we talk about it's so hard. Well, it's, yeah, it's hard everywhere in those types of environments, but there's a lot of beautiful families um and a lot of beautiful couples coming together and building and we just don't talk about them and, and so thank you for seeing that and i remember too i remember me and my wife uh getting into a real debate i think it it was the episode when um it, it was it was i think it was like two things going on william was at a halloween party and he kept getting all this attention from all the women so he was loving it but then tony had got tony's boyfriend that took her back but cheated on her oh, just yeah. to get back at her right i remember yeah. Yes. And, and I remember like me and my wife got into a real debate about that because I was I was rooting for Greg. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> I was rooting for Greg at the time. Yeah, Tony did him wrong. And, yeah, exactly. and he did and he doubled down and did her wrong. And so the question I would debate throwing in myself in the debate is that do two wrongs make a right? You know, at what point do we stop this? Because it is, it, and that's what happens with pain. It keeps escalating yes. and it gets out of control. And I think we could say that one, that was, that was far, but that's how deep he, she hurt him. And we have to also be responsible for that initial hurt. But then at some point we got to stop. And then where, where, and where do we go when we need to stop? Where's the backstop always is God. And so that was a huge moment for me to have Donnie McCurkin on the show. That was huge. So my Angela, you were talking about fights. They were like, you want to do what now? I was like, Amazing. I want to go to church. <laughs> and, and I didn't want to build a set. That was the thing. That was one of my big things is that 
was so important to our humanity, whether you, and I fought really hard on this for being Mary Jane to making those, I'm going to give a shout out to Loretha Jones, my executive then. She, she was in the fight with me and got, and, and my point is this, those sets, those environments, seeing black bodies context into the world is important. That scene had resonance because we literally shot at a church as opposed to building a church set and throwing in some extras. We packed that in. So everybody, that, that was an expensive scene. And I had to save a lot of money to get the, you know, get the executives at the time to, to say yes to that. And then I had to pay for Donnie McClurkin. And you know, all that, the expense of that story was huge. And so I had to save a bunch of pennies on other episodes in order to afford that episode. Wow. And it, but it was worth it. It was one of the first times we went off, off set, you know what I'm saying, out, out, out of the studio and went on location. Those were big moments for me. I think um, I was talking about the two directors. I think Sheldon Epps really helped those actors find their voice and their legs and the rhythms. I mean, he, he was, I'm so thankful to him as a collaborator. And I think when Celine came in and he brought, he found a way to take my vision into that, that single camera vision into the restraint, the constraints of a four camera sitcom. He's helped me to sort of open it up and bridge the two worlds. So the show didn't look like what the hell is going on? Is it, you know what I'm saying? And so help. So I think that wedding episode, uh, Tony's wedding, when we, he, the hybrid, um, the visual, he visually helped me get more of my vision out um, in so that we can see it. But having their black bodies in context, I'm really proud of that. And I hope people, that was huge to get us off the set. Because I know I'm getting a little inside baseball, but when you're shot just a close up all the time, sitcoms are shot at the sitcom, you know, at the, you know, most, I mean, the way we look, I think why Zoom is, is some of these things can translate because the way we're shooting is an old style, like right up to just get right in the face for the comedy. And I was like, how about, I just want to see them move in the room, move through space, be outside, you know what I'm saying? Be in the world. That intrinsically pushes the button and makes the viewer feel their humanity, feel their idea about how they're, they are in and of the world. You know what I'm saying? Those things, I you know people are like, I just want to get to my favorite joke and I love that, but those things make me most proud sometimes to see what we were able to chip away. And I remember Donnick McClurkin and I had a talk that day. I'll never forget it. He goes, Mara, we put in, he goes, he goes, he was flipping the pages. He was like, it's about 10 pages just about church and and I'm going to sing, the, you know, we fall down and I get to preach. He goes, we bringing this to television. We bringing this to mainstream. I was like, yeah, I said, and it, 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 he just, he was like, how are you doing this? I said, it's just our humanity. It's just who we are. And, um, and that deserves, again, going back to that validation question, it deserves a, a big, a big stage. It, de it deserves a moment like this. Why not? Um, so anyway, thank you for letting me revisit that. Those, those are the things I'm excited about um, revisiting as well. I didn't know you was on Frasier. I didn't know you wrote on Frasier. Did no, I didn't. Okay. Sheldon Epps. Sheldon Epps. So so Kelsey, you know, is one of the produce. Well, the Negative show, yeah. yeah, the the show came through his company at the time, and so um, one of the introductions we had was to Sheldon Epps, who was a director on at the time. Because Omar, you might like this director, and I'm like, oh, really? And so met Sheldon Epps, and he was very integral. A, a big, he's in um, at the Pasadena Playhouse. Um, the artistic director there, or the former artistic director there, he might, he might be emeritus at this point, but um, but he really helped us understand characters and work that stage in a way that they just felt real. And I think that's why I think that's why people still love the show. They felt real and helping the actors embody that, interpret the uh, the language and um, and translate it to the four camera. Um, and then and then and, and then we just built from there. So that's what I meant by Frazier. Do you and speak to this day? Are you are you cool with each other? Kelsey and I. It's so funny. I don't talk to him. You know, no. I mean, I, I, I mean, we're cool. We're cool. We made we made each other a bunch of money, or I made him a lot of money once. I guess I could say we're we're cool. I I've heard in in interviews. I saw um, him do. 
Yeah. And I, and I, I'm like, Oh, wow. That's sweet. Kelsey. Right. <laughs> so yeah. So in that way, um, but I haven't seen him in a while. No, I'm, um, but I'm sure the checks he likes still. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, Kelsey, Kelsey grandma, he was the EP on girlfriend and that girlfriend got made at a time when I would assume it was harder to get a black show like that made. So how was he as a white man, a, a good partner? What, what was, what was the benefit? Well, what, and it's, and it, here's real simple. So someone of his caliber and at the time to your, he was huge. He was like keeping the lights on at Paramount. So meaning like if Paramount had a, had any sort of losses, Frazier was the one it was, it was writing big checks. I mean, I'm saying it was holding it down. So I met him at that stage in his career, right? He had a deal um, like he would, and he didn't have any shows that year. He didn't, he didn't sell anything. And I was, we were kind of on the late, my development was backwards. In fact, UPN came to me and said, Mara, we would love a companion piece for the Parkers. I know Moesha and Parkers were already paired, but they were having success with the Parkers and they thought they were maybe gonna switch nights and they wanted the companion piece. So what would you do? And I basically pitched them girlfriends, but I didn't have a studio. It doesn't typically happen that way. Typically you have a studio partner and then you and the studio partner go pitch to the network. I had a network, but had no studio. And Kelsey at the time had nothing, he hadn't sold anything in the marketplace. And, um, so he still had money on the books, meaning, you know, a studio, if Kelsey wants to do something, he could be like, hey, I found something, let's get this in. And, it, and, and this is what I love about Kelsey. He was very, he was like, it's already sold? <laughs> yeah, I'll take that, meeting. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to do anything. And, and then um, it was, it's so I do, I really do appreciate the fact that he said yes. He could have said no. He could have just said, hey, I'll sit out this year, but he didn't. Okay, here's a show. It's good. It's well written. I laughed a few times. I remember he said that. Um, <laughs> and and he was like, "Yeah, let's do it." You know, and and that's how. And so because he said yes, and if that's all Kelsey ever did, I am so thankful for that yes. You know what I'm saying? Because to come through, you know, to you know, and that was even funny. Kelsey Grammer. This that got people's attention too. Kelsey right. Grammer show about oh, black women <laughs> what is this so it just sort of kept following the um the rolling rock so to speak and it was a blessing and to quote what he said about you just now he was talking about he was asked about girlfriends and he talked about how the show was going to go on strike it's like people were going on strike all kinds of issues and he said um he thought it deserved a proper send-off and he talked about tracy ellis ross being on blackish and then he said girlfriend's movie would be fun but you would have to get mara brock a kill to write it and i'm not sure she's available right now because <laughs> she's working on other projects that was really nice um yes i that's that was really nice to hear. I heard, I heard that same quote and, and it was really, um, it was beautiful to see, you know what I'm saying? After all this time that people can have, what is that quote you guys may can help me with this? People may not know what you did, but they, they don't know how to make you feel. feel. And so it's nice to have that, a good feeling, you know what I'm saying, after all this time. And so I'm excited about that. I just feel like it's such a no brainer. I mean, I would assume Kelsey would have to be involved in if y'all did a mini series, right? Or a movie or something. But it's like now you got Kenya Barris, who was a writer on Girlfriends, who's huge in Hollywood. Tracy yeah. Ellis Ross, yourself, you and Kenya at Netflix. I feel like it's a no-brainer for Netflix <laughs> to do. You and Kenya in a room should be able to make that happen in two seconds. Yeah, they didn't bring it up yet. Nobody brought Haven't it up. Haven't brought it up yet. I just got my, again, I just got there. I just got, I just got there. Let's see what they are doing. I'm there to keep, I, I am there to build new content and I'm excited about that. I got to do that. But I, like I, 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 it should be a no brainer, Charlemagne. It should be a no brainer. I also think to deal in January with Fox. So you have both of those. How does that work? We're working that out. <laughs> no, no, actually I do. I, I'm, I'm waiting to hear even about that project. I'm, I had so much fun. I, I will say you were asking about my writing process. I did, I, I did write the, um, the pilots for that Fox series. And so it's in a holding pattern, like a lot of Hollywood is in a holding pattern. I mean, right. COVID has, the pandemic, it has has a ripple effect through, is a bottleneck of, of, of a lot, 
happening. So I'm in that, um, I'm on the tarmac and seeing what, what will happen with that. Um, but my, my focus right now is at Netflix to build something new. So that, that could very much happen. So we'll see. You know, another thing I referenced too, I referenced um, the fact how girlfriends normalized therapy. I mean, back then I wasn't going to therapy, but oh. that was the first time I started to see therapy when Tony, Jill's character, Tony, was, was always going to see her therapist. And like, we're just getting to the point now where we can have those convos about mental health in the black community. What made you add that then? I love that. Thank. First of all, I love what you're doing in the conversation around mental health for thank us. You. So I want to say thank you for that. And that's and, and probably the same way that you are so adamant about it. I was too. That I appreciate the church. I love the church. But we were still having the conversations about that's not what we do. That's not what black people do. You know, um, white people do that. And I'm like, ah, no. We need we need this. We need this more than ever. And and Angela you were talking about toxic relationships. You know what I'm saying? That's what Joan was in. She was, how do you sort that out? And they took it to church. The church brought them back together, but how are we going to sustain this? How are we going to break some of these patterns and have a breakthrough? And rest his soul, Fred Willard, I love when he said yes, and he was Joan's therapist. And that was another sort of fun to bring that caliber of actor into um you know, into the black world, you know what I'm saying? And they were like, yeah, this is, and, and that was also fun. I remember he read the script, he goes, this is funny. My <laughs> agent sent me this, this is fantastic. And it's like, and 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 he loved being there and the the scenes between Tracy and he too were so wonderful. Um, but therapy was a conversation around, we need other alternatives. And I wanted to put it out there so that we can think about it, that we, we would consider that. And um, that, and, and obviously, great to tell stories, but really, it was another gift to the culture. Just like, you know, just like Lynn was a gift um, in a lot of ways. It's funny to me, like I've noticed this generation, they um, love Lynn, but at the time, Lynn was not one of the favorite characters, or no one said that she was one of their favorite characters. Lynn is one of the favorite characters because she is she sort of breaks this whole idea that black women got to be strong and have that all together. Yeah. And, you know, like this narrative about what black women should be, you know what I'm saying? And we only do this. And, and she was my free bird. She was the one that, although she did not have it together, she was still worth loving. She was still worth figuring out. And we all need that support. And she had that support. She slept on everybody's couch, <laughs> but she found her way. We all don't blossom at the same time. And I think we need to give space for that too, our humanity in general, but for black people too. I think we put so much, we have so much pressure on us, but that we dismiss a character like Lynn as being lazy or lost or whatever. And how do we, or maybe she's not as ambitious and thus not worthy or valuable. And I, I wanted to add that to the conversation, inclusive of therapy, you know, things like that, that we weren't thinking around those ways that blackness was one way and it's like no it's not <laughs> yeah i mean i think about that one episode where tony um the, the, her therapist told her to write a letter to her mom and she was like nah so she ended up bringing her mom to therapy yes, yes, yes. Caused more problems <laughs> jennifer lewis let's can we jennifer shout lewis, out jennifer yes. lewis, jennifer lewis oh, yes beretta that i named her after my aunt who has um who has passed away but she is uh that Beretta was just a force of nature and it was so lovely to have Jennifer add to again you're talking about collaborators working with great people like her building yeah. on comedy chops challenging us you know that's another fun thing with the writers you throw something at the actor they hit it back you want to hit it back you want to hit it back but yeah um and and then to explore you know alcoholism through that character that's what you know that and that she again that and finding oh tony's source of pain is around this very, very real issue that a lot of us have in our lives um and yet they were able to work it out and they were able to find their way um and they were able to create space for each other because you've got to create space for a jennifer lewis you know for Beretta slash jennifer lewis um and that's the other thing that um, um one it was just fun i got to work with her and two Oh my God, whenever she was on set, it was, a, it was so much fun. Um, and she's been to the Breakfast Club every time. It's been a lot of fun also. Yes. Oh, it's a lot of energy, isn't it? <laughs> a lot of love, though. 
I am excited for this weekend. We'll be watching Thank Girlfriends. You. Everybody will be watching. If you haven't seen it, then you got to start from season one. But for everybody that is a huge Girlfriends fan, and there's so many of us, I know we'll all be revisiting this and getting it trending and making sure that we're continuing that conversation. So congratulations on the deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you hope you and your and family and everybody is safe and the boys and everything are okay, even though I know it's a little crazy world for them right now. Yes, they are. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. They're doing good. They're in remote, you know, they're remote learning schools <laughs> right now. And I hope everybody makes it an event to watch Girlfriends this weekend like I am in my house. You know, I hope you like, they have watch parties and, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm having one too. I'm going to have a... So I, I call it my IG pre-sip. I'm going to do that. And I think, you know, it'll be fun to see who shows up for that. And then I'm tweeting live um, during the first two episodes. So I hope people come join my party. And it's, it comes out, it starts tonight, right? Midnight. No, tonight. it starts Friday night. Well, Friday. I, guess, I guess, well, midnight, you're right. I guess, midnight. yes, midnight. Friday morning. I'll be asleep. <laughs> I love my shows, but I will be asleep. And then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> Because you know, got to get that beauty rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but no, tomorrow at um, uh, at five, I'm going to go on IG Live with Strong Black Lead. I'm so thankful to them. And then um, at six, I'm going to live tweet the first two episodes. So um, I'll put it out on my gram. I'm a little behind on my posting, but I'm going to put it, put it out there, like, spread the word. It's cool. Wow. You're busy. You show up. You guys show up. Come and holler at me. Why not? We <laughs> pull up. Mara, thank you very much. You have a great weekend. Thank you too. Hey, right. thank you guys. Really thank appreciate you. you. Thank you. You stay well, stay healthy.